fourth and final Wayne's 2019 awardee is Dr. Darlene Lim, who is being honored with the Women of Discovery Air and Space Award. Dr. Lim is a geobiologist based at the NASA Ames Research Center in California. Have you ever wondered what your life would be like on Mars? You might imagine the challenges, but Dr. Lim is leading a team that is making human space exploration a reality. Dr. Lim leads many NASA-funded research programs that blend scientific field research with the development of concepts for future human spaceflight into deep space and Mars. Her teams work in labs, meeting rooms, and at field sites ranging from underwater to the poles to, the, to active volcanoes and beyond. Here are just some of the NASA-funded programs she heads up. Subsea, Basalt, <coughs> Pavilion Lake, and Survey Finesse research programs. On these teams, Dr. Lim ensures that collaboration creates results. She describes a, a daily juggle between the big picture and details. Dr. Lim is also a passionate promoter of science and exploration, education and outreach efforts, and founded the Haven House Family Shelter STEM Explorers and Speakers Series, which from 2012 to 2015 enabled NASA and academic researchers to conduct educational sessions with homeless children in the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Dr. Darlene Lim. So thank you so much to the board, uh, to all the fellows for this incredible honor and for an amazing couple of days already. And thank you to Maude and to Claire for hosting us at two different events, which were just fantastic and to the three amazing, let me see, scientists, leaders, mothers, innovators who I've gotten to know and hang out with, amazing women. Thank you so much for just sharing your passion. It's been great. Um, so we're gonna switch gears a bit. We're gonna leave Earth, <laughs> although all our work that we do in service of trying to get humans on back to the moon and onwards to Mars is done here on Earth. We have a job that entails a lot of delayed gratification. We have to think about the future, the future that may be actually sooner than 50 years. It could be within 20 years that we start to see people actually progress much deeper into space than we've ever seen them do before. And in fact, a few weeks ago, NASA laid down um, a new deadline. We love deadlines. 2024 is when we look forward to seeing humans return to the moon. So now we have this incredible deadline that will then propel us forward onwards to Mars. So um, this, is the, this is the pathway that we're headed towards at this juncture in time. There are other pathways that, in, that have been envisioned by folks such as Elon Musk, whereby we go direct to Mars. But regardless, any of the planetary stops that we make as humans working in tandem with robots, we're going to see a lot of advances and incredible innovations um, that will take us above, you know, beyond uh, the confines of low Earth orbit um, into these amazing areas. As we move from Earth onwards to Mars, there are opportunities to learn at every single juncture. And what I'm gonna tell you about are projects that we have here on Earth that allow us to understand the intricacies specific to science. So what's amazing is in this journey that, we, that, we're, that we're looking forward to, moving you know, from the low Earth orbit onto the moon and onwards to Mars, um, trying to inject the conversation with science and not just have it fueled uh, strictly by engineering is actually a very difficult thing to do. And um, in particular, one of the things that we've noticed is that there is a thought that as humans move deeper and deeper <coughs> into space, we will have to sort of relinquish the fact that we'll be able to talk with them and have control over those missions and give them input. And so as we envision this world of moving humans from Earth and onwards to Mars, we're actually only going to be able to move a handful of people, anywhere from, say, four to six people if it's a NASA mission, to say something in the realm of 12 to 20 people if you have larger spacecraft. But regardless, your intellectual capital, the scientists that will have invested their lives in these types of missions that have all of the expertise to do with finding life on other planets will be here on Earth. And so there's a team of us that have been trying to understand whether or not operationally, whether or not the designs, the engineering, all of the different procedures can be imbued with science at this particu particular juncture in time, early on, instead of retrofit later on when we have to deal with very clunky designs that don't necessarily support science and discovery. So on Earth, um, and let's actually, oops, 
how do I play each one individually? Is there a way? Somebody may have to. Sorry, Bianca. <laughs> you want to click in the upper, what we do is, uh, that's perfect. So as uh, the Earth and Mars kind of move around each other in our solar system, they come close, they move apart, and you can have a communication delay anywhere from three to 22 minutes. And what that means is basically it takes the, you know, it takes light or any sort of signal a certain amount of time to travel between the two entities. And that may increase or decrease to, depending on the orbital parameters of those two planets. Now everything on Earth, and Bianca, if you don't mind pressing the upper right, um, that would be great. Everything on Earth is optimized for the speed of light as it basically flows through our entire technical system at about 7.5 orbits per second at the surface of the Earth. And so we hate delays. If any of you are into video games, you know that even a millisecond can actually disrupt your ability to be happy and you know, kill your fellow, whoever it is at the other end of the country. Um, I'm probably speaking about this from a 12-year-old boy standpoint. I have one at home. Um, but also making a phone call, say to somebody on the other side of the Earth. If you, if you even have less than a second of a delay, it's very annoying. So everything on Earth we try and optimize for speed. But fundamentally, and so if you don't mind pressing the middle one now, as we move beyond the Earth, back to the Moon and onwards to Mars, we're going to have to contend with the fact that light can only travel as fast as it can, and there will be a delay, anywhere from about one to two seconds delay between the Earth and Moon when we send a signal. So that means I will say hi, and then somebody will say that. And then if you click the bottom one, this is where it gets super annoying. Oops. <laughs> oh yes, especially when you have a technical difficulty like this. So if the last one comes back, it'll actually demonstrate Ah, okay. So it's funny because when Bianca and I did a test, we weren't quite sure if it was working, but the whole point is it's so slow you can't even tell what's going on. <laughs> a signal, so again, it's very strange, right? Because you're supposed to optimize for speed. But a signal has now left the Earth in this little cartoon at the bottom. And um, in this circumstance here, about three and a bit minutes later, it'll finally reach Mars. So if you imagine a scenario where something as innocuous as wondering whether or not I, as a, sci as a scientist or as an astronaut on Mars, should pick up a particular rock, and I want to know if I should for my buddy who's on Earth, I ask them the question, I gotta wait three minutes for that question to reach them, and then for them to think about it and then send it back is another at least three minutes. Now if you think about a more dangerous situation where you have somebody in distress, where you have a problem with some of your equipment that is um, problematic for your life, that delay becomes a real difficulty. So a lot of what we've been testing is to try and understand if within these operational, they're called operational parameters, we can actually do science, but what we've been learning is extensible and translatable to the world of just basic life support for EVA, um, for extravehicular activity, for the exploration of these different planetary systems. Um, so what we expect in the future is that exploration, EVAs, extravehicular activities, will become more frequent, they will become more efficient, they will become more productive and more flexible. So um, many of you have probably seen some of the images from the moon when the Apollo missions were active. Uh, what that mission was set out to do was effectively to win, we wanted to get there first, but also to do some very kind of short-term exploration. Um, science didn't really come into the conversation until much later on, but, all, but already all of our designs were in place the engineering was there, and we had to sort of deal with what we had and do the best we could and try and explore. Um, but as we move deeper into space and onwards to Mars, we're expecting that we're going to have stays on the surface of, of Mars up to you know, 400, 500 days as an example. We're going to want to put up solar arrays, um, connect power generators. We're going to want to do science and exploration. And we talked about this at lunch today, but anytime you go out and do science and exploration, I guarantee you that these three amazing women are not in heels, they're in very comfortable shoes, they're out there, they're bending down, they're lifting things up, they're crawling on their hands and knees, they're looking for snails in very uncomfortable you know, situations, so, which are so icky, they're so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you have to imagine a more flexible situation than what you've seen, not only with the Apollo missions, but also um, currently with the International Space Station. So there's a question, how might we design EVAs that are in service of science and exploration and discovery? And that's really what the focus of my work has been over the last uh, decade. Um, these are some images that show that historically, to learn how to prepare and, and to prepare for planetary scientific exploration, we have with the moon uh, missions as an example, with the Apollo missions, 
taken astronauts and trained them in different field settings that are relevant geologically, as an example, to the moon. Um, so we've gone to places in Arizona and Hawaii, we've been taking them to Iceland and, and taught them about geology and what they might expect to see um, when they got to the moon. And what we now have to think about is how do we not only teach them something, something that they can learn um, with, you know, while a teacher is there, while their safety net is there, uh, and understand what rocks they're, they're seeing in front of them. How do we move them from that capability into a capability of being able to truly absorb their environment and be scientists themselves out in the field? So there's that training element as well. And then how do we learn from the science community on how best to support these individuals, whether it's through hardware, through software, protocols, and other sorts of support mechanisms. So we use these projects that I work on called analogs, which um, is, is not in the world of tech. They we say analogs, people get really upset. It's, it's meant to be an analogous comparative um, environment, uh, not something very simple with you know, beeps and bops. Um, and so we go out into areas that um, have, in some cases, in the deep ocean as an example, um, we run these projects that bring together science, operations, and technology um, because we can take advantage of the deep sea environment as an analog to other sort of um, environments in our solar system. Um, past environments on Mars, hydrothermal systems that have, um, were likely active on the surface of Mars uh, millions of years ago, as well as active um, hydrothermal systems on other moons um, in our solar system, such as Enceladus. And so we look out into our Earth-bound environment for these types of analogies. And then something that I have been working on is actually bringing in other analogies, so operational and technical analogies into um, our capacity to understand how we need to support science in the future. So as an example, um, I work with this organization called the Ocean Exploration Trust, and they run this exploration uh, vessel called the Nautilus. And the Nautilus um, is a ship that can only take so many people. I think there's probably less than about 50 people on the ship. And most of that, those people are not scientists. You only have about 12 people on the ship that are allowed to do, that are there to do science. The rest of the scientists um, who are interested in the collections that we're going to gather, in the science overall that we're going to, to gather up, um, they reside in a, in a basically in a boardroom um, in, at the University of Rhode Island in a place called the Inner Space Center. So that's basically their mission support center. So what we do is um, we work with these people and we work with their operational setup as an analogy to a future Mars mission architecture. So one example of an architecture is that you would send humans as close to Mars as possible, get them in orbit, and have them control robots on the surface. And in that circumstance, they would have very little delay, communication delay between themselves and when they press the joystick and when the robot will actually action into some task. Um, right now, with the Mars Exploration Rovers, there's a huge delay, so you can get anywhere from the, that three to 20 minute delay. It means that your exploration is very stunted. Um, and so we're moving to understand, oops, actually you can probably, you know what, we'll skip over this. This is a video I can show you at the end of this time. Um, but we're using that uh, ocean faring environment to um, understand low latency telerobotics. It's, you're gonna have to, sorry, you'll have to press the button again, but it's okay, we'll move forward. Um, I'm actually gonna move from the deep ocean and tell you about a different project called Basalt. And this project is based on land. It's, um, we work with volcanic environments as an analog to Mars. Um, we just published a special collection of papers in this journal, Astrobiology. Everything is um, open to the public and downloadable. So if you just Google Astrobiology and Basalt, um, we have 13 different research papers that have come out that span science, operations, and technology. Um, and it talks specifically about supporting human scientific research specific to Mars. Um, and so the two different sites that we've worked on um, are in Hawaii, in the East Rift Zone, which is meant to represent as an analog early Mars. And then also present day Mars, it was represented by a site in Idaho. And again, similar to that deep sea um, uh, test and uh, mission that I showed you, we have three different components that we integrate, um, science, technology, and science operations. And I just want to stop there for a minute and say that our projects are indeed multidisciplinary, but they really hum when they're interdisciplinary, when people kind of leave their egos and all of their obfuscations at the door and come together and work across their disciplines. That's when we get to the really amazing aha moments. So our missions are driven by science. I am a scientist by training, and so I like to imbue all of our projects with the science again so that we can force out 
what type of designs will work in support of human scientific exploration of Mars. Um, and what we have found is that not only do we have findings in the realm of engineering and operations, but many findings come out through our science that are pushing forward in terms of our knowledge of how to explore scientifically when it comes to looking for life, for example, on Mars. We work in those two volcanic environments, collecting rocks, understanding the geology, the geochemistry, also understanding the microbial constituents associated with those rocks. And what we have found is that there's a whole idea of just follow the water. Follow the water and the signs of water on Mars in order to find life. And in fact, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We have to understand some of the, um, the kind of limitations that that water and that rock interaction may have had over time and whether or not the right kind of uh, minerals and elements and nutrients have been released to support microbial constituents. And so that means you have to have a much more holistic sampling um, program when you actually sample not only with humans but also work with robotic missions. So there's a lot of different elements that we learn about when we get into the field setting and what we do with our programs because we have scientists that need to articulate what it is that they need done and then speak to the engineers and that can be, I'm sure many of you in the room work in those types of environments, but regardless getting those two groups to talk to each other can be very difficult to do. Um, so we force the, the scientists to draw out a, tr a traceability matrix that outlines all of their different questions and, and, um, and tasks and so forth and objectives. And then we translate that into EBA designs that we will then test in the field. And we, we design those um, EBAs both, both strategically, so over an entire mission which can take up to three weeks, and we also design them for tactical reasons so that day by day we're checking off to see whether or not we're hitting our goals. And then we'll go out into the field and actually collect science and collect rocks that hit different scientific objectives. And um, what the operations specialists or the EVA specialists that are primarily from the NASA Johnson Space Center will do is they will take all that knowledge and then they'll design these EVA timelines. And so what you see here is actually a construct where we've taken the way that an, a geologist will approach a site and then laid it out two-dimensionally in terms of the fact that they'll approach a site, they'll do a survey, a contextual survey, they'll start to look around for what it is that they want to do, and then they'll start to gather kind of large samples up and then they'll start to really down select because even as an earthbound scientist, I can't collect everything that I really want to collect. So they took all of that knowledge and then created these timelines which then translated into these other timelines um, that were dynamic and moved and adapted with every moment of our missions as we went into the field. So I keep talking about going into the field. What we would do is then um, about 90% of our lives is spent out of the field, in labs, in meetings, talking you know, in, with each other and uh, between our, our groups. And then finally we get out into, out into the field, whether it's Idaho or Hawaii. And then we'll set up you know, our science is real, so we have a bevy of graduate students who need to graduate, so we can't fail in terms of their collections, but we set up a mission simulation. So we'll set ourselves up to be like Mars. And um, what we do is we actually have a room, uh, and, and this is an example in Hawaii, so we'll actually separate all of our scientists and they're on Earth time, and then we'll have a group of people who are out in the field supporting these two individuals who are astronauts, um, acting on our scientific uh, group's behalf to collect samples. And then we've got this other group of people here acting as two other sets of astronauts sitting on Mars in a separate room in a habitat. And so these people here are all on Mars time and these people on Earth time and we delay the signal between these groups. And there can be anywhere between 15 and 20 kilometers separating all these groups. I think I've gone, I might be out of time, so I'll expedite the rest of this. Um, but uh, the um, missions that we support, this is an example of basalt, um, they get very complicated. We can have upwards of 80 to 20, or to 200 people, pardon me, um, supporting this entire program. And um, in the field, sorry Bianca, I'd have to get you to click on the bottom and the top one. Once people are actually active and out in the field, um, this is the Ivy workstation, a lot of things start to happen. Um, you can click on the top one too. So we are working on software systems that support these missions, uh, hardware, so if you want to click through, the next one might need a, let's see, let's move forward since we're running low on time with everyone. So one of the things that we do is um, we look specifically at the requirements again 
that are necessary for science to be imbued in these design challenges. And one of the capabilities that we've been looking at, and sorry, Bianca, I'm going to make you get up again to press the button, <laughs> is um, mixed reality and the capacity for mixed realities to support our missions. Um, and so we know that mixed reality is cool, so that's augmented reality and, and virtual reality. Everybody in the space uh, community thinks it's, it's going to be a good thing to have, but nobody's really tested it. So we started to do that in some of our missions. Uh, where we created virtual scenes for our, our astronauts as well as our scientists to move through in advance of and during um, the mission so that they could really understand the field site before getting there and, they could, and the scientists who were removed from the action in the field could understand what the astronauts were doing. And we collected a series of uh, metrics on this experiment and we're going to be publishing that a little later this year. Um, let's move to the next one. We also worked with augmented reality. So this is um, an example of a technology where we could actually put a virtual um, or an augmented scene of a path for an astronaut in front of them. And this path is created by an algorithm that takes into account um, that woman's uh, metabolic capacity as well as the topography of the land and then overlays um, a pathway for her to safely traverse across volcanic terrain. The last thing that we, I'll show you is, um, if you just click this button here, is we also worked with um, this system called Holoskype, where the IV team could actually uh, annotate a scene in front of them on their screen. And then what would happen 15, 20 kilometers away is the astronaut would actually see those projections in front of them on, the, on a rock. And so as they walked around the rock, that, that would actually stay there and that would indicate to them what was of value and what wasn't. So we used all of these, dis these systems, we've been collecting metrics on them, um, as well as designing things such as these hardware systems, these backpacks, that will become very important in terms of transmitting communication um, as humans go about their way in um, exploring Mars. Um, I'm going to move on for that and just wrap up and just say that these are the highlights that I wanted to put forward. And that if we choose to prioritize scientific exploration during human uh, spaceflight, then we must consider the requirements of science from the get-go. And science exploration requirements will fundamentally change the way that we design, plan, and execute future human spaceflight missions. And throughout this effort to build uh, systems that enable and enhance science, the real trick is to also enable the retention of our humanity within each moment of human spaceflight and exploration. That truly is the trick. Objective-oriented um, uh, input instead of task-oriented inputs. So you, if you if you tell a smart person generally what you need to do, they'll do it. They'll figure it out. And it's not like we're going to send dummies up into Mars. We're going to send some really you know well-trained individuals. And if you give them the big picture, and sometimes that, that sounds like a very easy thing to do, but it's really hard to get a bunch of scientists to sit down and you know scope out the big picture and then kind of bubble up what are the major objectives and then how does that down select into specific tasks. And then you can give all those tasks out, but a lot of times we just, we, when you get into the field, as I'm sure you know, anybody who's gone in the field will, will realize, everything goes wrong. And so you can spend 90% of your life training and, and preparing for it, but there's always something that creeps in, a gizmo that you just, you know, a gremlin that you didn't know would pop up. Um, and in those moments, if if you give people the overall objective, they'll be able to innovate their way through and, and get to the end. So that is something that we constantly see pop up in. And the, the humanity is the, is the individual, right? We have to also understand that we've got to design for um, a collective, but also ultimately, I think we've got to make sure that whoever we've, we've earmarked early on as those people going into Mars, we've got to tweak things a little bit for each of those people. Um, and I think that'll be important too to help them reach their full potential. 